Hi there, I'm Megan. I'm the executive director of the Asheville Downtown Association. And I'm happy to welcome you all here tonight. This is our first event of 2019. I do have a couple just quick announcements I'd like to make. Um, our second annual Downtown Business Census Survey is open. The deadline is Monday um, at the end of business, and it's really critical that we hear from our downtown business community. The responses to this survey, they shape policy, they help shape initiatives. Um, it's just really important. So if you haven't done that, please take um, about 15, 10, 15 minutes to fill out that survey, but also encourage your neighbor, neighboring businesses to do so as well. So uh, part of the reason we have Kimber here today is because this is Love Asheville Go Local Week. Yay. So you can go to um, loveasheville.org and you can see what our local businesses are doing to celebrate. And then on Saturday, at the Great Eagle from 1.30 to 4, yes, we're going to have a local social. Uh, Pleasure Chest will be playing for free. Of course, the bar will be open, food will be available, but come network with your fellow local businesses and celebrate and culminate uh, Love Asheville Go Local Week. Okay, so on to tonight's programming. This Building Our City Speaker Series is made possible by our generous sponsors. You see them here. The Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority, Mosaic Community Lifestyle Realty, the Asheville Downtown Association, the City of Asheville, Urban 3, Carlton Collins Architecture, Asheville Grown, Mountain True, the Aloft Asheville Downtown, and Friction Shift. And I think we have representatives from all of those businesses here with us tonight. Thank you. For, thank you for your support. So I'd like to invite uh, Mike Regura of Mosaic Realty up to say a few words. Mike. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep this very brief because I know you didn't come here to hear me talk. Um, but just want to say that I do uh, feel like Mosaic Realty is a good poster child for what we're going to hear about tonight. I started the company in 2010, and my mission was to do the bulk of my advertising through sponsoring uh, local events and local nonprofits. And we've kept true to that. And um, this year, I think we're on track to do over $100,000 in local sponsorship. And nonprofit uh, contributions, in, including this one tonight. So thank you very much for supporting local businesses, and uh, thank you for coming. All right. Thank you, Mike. So we did want to mention our next event, and I don't know how to work this computer. Look. Uh, our next event is May 8th with our new city manager, Deborah Campbell. It'll be right here at the Collider. Also, thanks to them for, for getting us all set up tonight. We appreciate their assistance. So please mark your calendars. And now I will turn things over to Meg Jamison. Meg's on the steering committee for Asheville Grown, and she's going to introduce tonight's speaker, Kimber. Thanks, Thanks Megan. All right. Thanks, everybody. So I'm Meg Jamison. I'm a steering committee of Asheville Grown, Go Local Campaign, and I'm proud to be here with my teammates. Raise your hand. Awesome. So <clears throat> I'm also the director of the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network, and so we we exist to scale sustainability in the South, and I constantly think about scale in my work. And when I think about scale, and I try and imagine who I should, who I should try and be when I grow up, <laughs> to scale movements, to build support for community efforts, I think about Kimber Lanning. And the reason I think about Kimber is because in 2013, 2014, 2015, I actually lived in Arizona. And I moved to Arizona, I didn't know Seoul, but I walked into Stinkweeds. How many people have heard of Stinkweeds? You have. Of course you have, Franzi. Stinkweeds is the record store that Kimber started when she was 17, and she was there that day. So I got to meet Kimber in person. I'd heard about Kimber, thought a lot about what it means to, to really kind of drive a movement like I'd heard Kimber doing. So I was lucky enough to meet her. I was lucky enough to then work for Kimber for two years after that as the Northern Arizona director. And so Kimber taught me what it means to scale a movement. She runs the largest local business coalition in the country. She scaled that up from, I don't even know where you started, but she scaled it up quick from one, <laughs> from Stinkweeds. Um, she is the driver of an inclusive economic movement in the state of Arizona. It is something that is so meaningful to me personally. It's something that we are doing here and something that we can continue to do here. So it means a lot. Kimber is a true inspiration, um, and your list of credentials is really too too big to include here, <laughs> so I won't. Um, but personally, I, I just, I, I believe in what you do. I'm glad you're here. Um, you're such an advocate for things that we need to be doing here in Asheville, and you have a lot to share. 
So um, I'm glad that you're here today. And one of the things that I, I know that you will say, but something I want to say is one of the most meaningful things that you ever taught me is that the power of this, this economy that we all talk about is actually right here in the room and is in our hands. And so you'll probably see that, Kimber, but it's something that's always really dri been driven home to me. So thank you. Kimber. Okay, um, I'm thrilled to be here, and I've really enjoyed the day uh, with all of you that took time to show me around today, and um, I really appreciate it. It's very um, true what they say about uh, that Southern hospitality, because spending the time here today, I got to see a lot of different things that I wouldn't normally get to see when I speak in different places around the country. Um, so just a little bit about my background, um, as Meg mentioned, I um, started a record store many years ago. We're just getting ready to celebrate 32 years. And being in the music business gave me a front row seat to how challenging it is to run a small business, especially in that particular field where our, our battles were against Sony and Warner Brothers, right? And um, I also started an art gallery uh, on a blighted and burned out stretch of downtown Phoenix. Um, there was a hubcap shop and a liquor store on a street, and I opened up an art gallery there. And you can imagine how many people told me that was the dumbest thing ever. And we did live music and theater and film, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time, and over the next 12 years, was able to, with a number of other small businesses, completely transform that street. And we ended up with 23 art galleries, five retailers, about six or eight restaurants and coffee shops, and we ended up being named one of the top five arts districts in the country. And that, again, is not a story about me. That's a story about the power of what small and local businesses can do. Um, and now, where you know, this ramshackle building that I bought in the late 90s is now on one of the highest performing real estate centers in the entire Phoenix metropolitan area. And so that, again, got me thinking about the power of small uh, enterprises and what we can do. And so in 2003, I launched Local First Arizona. And that has also been uh, an awakening and sort of an emerging process over time. We started very much uh, with the orientation of corporate versus local, that we, that we really wanted to have local ownership. And I've learned more and more about how to talk about that, how to advocate for that. Um, and really, um, we've got many, many, many studies now that show that a lot of the things that I was doing early on, just basically on a hunch, have actually... Um, turns out they're very true. So I'm going to share a lot of that with you here tonight. So the one thing that I want to call out is that across the country, this is again not just me, Kimber Lanning, as local first Arizona, but communities across the country. I travel around a lot and I speak, and there really are shifting economic priorities. For a very long time, economic development was primarily focused on this concept that the way to grow a local economy is to get companies to move from the outside in. And that has really been undone with many, many studies over the last 10 years that have, de have demonstrated many other ways you can grow an economy by simply attracting a company to, to move in. Uh, shifting spending, if we shifted our spending from a national to a local company, you're actually growing your local economy. There are many ways you can grow a local economy. And so we became big advocates of thinking differently about economic development. And I, I like to think of economic development as a five-pointed star. And you really need all five components of that in order to grow your economy. You need incubators. You need startup businesses. You need small and mid-sized business attraction. You need small and mid-sized business retention. I need a large business retention. And then you need business attraction. So there's retention. There's expansion, there's attraction, and there's incubators and startups. And you need all five of those firing in order to be successful. Now, in, in my state, and this is not uncommon, for about 25 years, 90% of our economic development dollars were spent focused just on business attraction. And we've successfully been able to work with the leadership to get them to shift some of their spending toward business retention and expansion. And I'm going to be talking to you a little bit more about those strategies, how we're doing that, uh, in ways that we're growing our own economy from within without getting out the war chest. I mean, in Arizona, we like to compete with Texas, right? Texas has a bigger war chest than Arizona, and they're going to win every time. I don't care how good your golf game is, those companies are going to go to Texas, right? Because we don't 
have the manpower and the, and the funding to get it done. And that's, that's our situation. Every once in a while, I mean, well, we attracted Google Glass, okay? We attracted Google Glass. A multi-million dollar deal, and you couldn't pick up the paper or even hear anything. You couldn't have a conversation without somebody saying, hey, we got Google Glass coming in. They're going to create 900 jobs. Literally, less than one year later, they quietly laid off 900 people and moved out of town. And they kept all of our money, and that was reported on page B13, right? So super important to understand all the ins and outs of business attraction and, and how it really is a net, it's like a shell game, right? And the winners are there's corporations that get paid those big bucks to move all around. And Amazon is really showing us how to do it right now, right? So then we also work really hard on placemaking, branding, and marketing for individual businesses, but also for entire communities. In 2013, my organization acquired the Arizona Rural Development Council. And I'm going to drill down later in my talk. Uh, about what we're doing uh, to build self-reliance in smaller towns where we have uh, our, our state's economic development strategy pretty much has left rural behind. We, in our budget, we've got $2 million total for all of Arizona's economic development in rural. $2 million total. Last year, they spent, two, uh, they spent all of that money on two one-mile stretches of roadway. Yeah, just to give you some perspective. Um, we also work on business clustering and collaboration. It's critically important that businesses of all sizes in a local economy learn how to work together. And so we are really good at developing supply chains, making sure our anchor institutions, local and non-local, all of them, figure out how they can source locally in order to drive that local economy. As Meg mentioned in the welcome, really the economy is ours to own. And so how can we work with our larger institutions to get them sourcing locally to drive the economy and jobs? So some of our strategies have been reducing economic leakage. If you look in any uh, community, there's dollars flowing around and those forces that be, and we like to measure where they're leaking out. You know, in a rural community, it can be a very simple thing. I, I, I've got a town of 1,300 people. I interviewed 100 men, and I found out that every man in that town has to drive an hour to get a haircut. So in order to plug that leak, I know that any guy that feels like being a barber, as long as he doesn't have a really shaky hand, he's probably going to do pretty well in that town, right? <laughs> and so I connect with the veterans incubator where they got guys coming back from war that are looking to start a company, and I can give them a list. Hey, I know that this little town needs a bike shop. This guy over here needs a dry cleaner. This guy over here needs a, a barber, right? And so that's how we're beginning to plug those leaks to build that self-reliance within those smaller communities. Um, we really, we talk all around the country of avoiding that big whale strategy, and that is that belief that this one big company, we could just get that one big company to move in here and create those jobs that's going to save us. That strategy never works. So taking those dollars and spreading them out across more existing successful businesses and being able to help them and looking for things like workforce development gaps and access to capital that your existing businesses need is a much better strategy than trying to get that big whale to come in. So we also work on leveraging local talent. Oftentimes you see this not necessarily here, but you'll often see a community that what I call it low community self-esteem. So if you got a big company there that wants to, let's just say they're looking for some tech, they want to develop something, they immediately overlook the local talent and they go, oh, well, we're going to go find them in LA or we're going to go find them in New York or whatever it might be. Looking locally for talent, I see some nodding heads over <laughs> here, right? The joke in Arizona, in Phoenix, was if you wanted to get a big gig with a big company in Phoenix, you had to go get an LA PO box because they never hire you if they knew you were from Phoenix. That is the ultimate low self-esteem for a community. So we need to, to think about those dollars and leverage them toward local talent. And my final point on that is how do we expect to keep young people, they start a company, if nobody will ever give them a shot? How do we expect to retain them? So that, that plays into youth retention there as well. Um, focusing, as I mentioned, on retention and, and expansion. Tourism and events. Um, I have learned a lot about both sides of the debate here in Asheville on tourism in, during my time here. We, you know, in Arizona, just if you can just imagine, Arizonans collectively spend six and a half billion dollars every year vacationing in California. So we have a stated goal of redirecting just 10% of that out into our rural towns. 
And so there's a lot to that, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but there's a lot to it in terms of increasing the capacity of the rural businesses, in terms of helping them with their customer service. I like to say, you know what, I can't tell people to go local if local sucks. <laughs> I can't, right? And as a small business owner, I can give that, you know, I can, I can say that. Yeah, I, I work really hard to get small businesses to be great. Because if we're going to survive the next 10 years of this infatuation with online retail, you've got to be great. You have got to provide an experience that is exceptional and makes people want to go out of their way to support your business. And frankly, if you don't get there, it's going to be very hard to survive. So um, I help towns establish a unique position in the market. You already have that. You've hit it out of the park. You know who you are. Your challenge here is going to be hanging on to it. Right? It's a whole different scenario. We got, I deal with a lot of towns that want so bad to be cool. They want to be just like you. But that, it's hard to stay on that. So you're riding a wave right now, and you're trying to stay on it. And it's going to be hard. That's going to be the challenge. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, investing in the business corridor and clustering those businesses in collaboration. And uh, the Asheville Grown Business Alliance is doing a lot of work around building that collaboration. And then supply chain development. So I'll be talking through some of those. So from a big, huge you know, 10,000 foot perspective, we know that localism is, is important for these three key reasons. Connection to place, jobs and economics. And I'm gonna drill down on those. So I put this up here because in Phoenix, Arizona, every third person is from Chicago and they won't stop telling you how great Chicago is. <laughs> All the time, right? If I ask that in an Arizona class, who here is tired of hearing about how great Chicago is? Like everybody will raise their hand, right? We get that a lot. And uh, nothing against Chicago. Chicago is a great town. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, Chicago arguably has about more hometown pride than anywhere else, right? The Cubs just lost for 100 years and didn't lose a single fan. Meanwhile, the Arizona Diamondbacks have a bad inning, and people are like, ah, oh, I'm out, you know? <laughs> you know, we don't have that kind of hometown pride, and, and Chicago's mastered it. So this is a true story, and I want you to think about this because ultimately I'm talking about relationships. Okay, just, just remember that word, relationships. I was standing in line next to a woman, never met her before. We were standing in line waiting for something. We're chit-chatting. She starts telling me how great Chicago is. I'm an Arizona girl. I was like, yeah, kind of tuned out a little. I've heard it all before. At one point, she lowered her voice and leaned into me, and she said, boy, you guys sure have made a mess out here in Arizona. And now I'm bobbing and weaving. Like, I'm, I'm like, that's it, right? And so then I'm thinking, I'm processing. And she said, you guys sure have made a mess. I said, oh, I said, you don't live here. She said, no, I live here. I said, oh, you haven't lived here very long then. She said, no, I lived here 15 years. So I said, who the heck is you guys? <laughs> like, you're one of us now. You, we see challenges. She was actually disassociated from the challenges we have in our community. I pushed back on her. I found out she had never voted. <laughs> I found out. That when she gave charitably, she gave back in Illinois. And then I started thinking about how does this hometown pride or lack thereof impact our economy? And so we started having that conversation. And I got the idea, put on my little visor, got my clipboard out, and I interviewed everybody I could find from Chicago. And I asked them one question. Tell me why you love Chicago so much. My smile grew bigger and bigger and bigger the further I went because without even realizing it in a million different ways, they said the locally owned businesses. Think about it. They said, oh, I love the restaurants and the chefs in Chicago. They said, in my old neighborhood, I used to pop into my favorite booth and they'd say, hey, Steve, you want the regular? They said, man, in Chicago, I had the same barber for 40 years. I come out here to Arizona and all you guys have is super cuts. I'd be like, that's not, that's not true. Give me 20 minutes, I'll find you 20 barbers. And they'd go, really, where? Right? And so what they had, what they were telling me, even, even somebody said, I bank at the same bank my great-grandparents banked at in Illinois. Right? And now I come out here, and I don't have that choice. They're talking about relationships. And you don't have a sense of place if where you're doing your business, your commerce, is a revolving door. You don't have the same sense of connection to place. And I'm very fortunate that after all of that, the Knight Foundation issued this fantastic report called Soul of the Community, in which they demonstrated that local business plays a critical role in the way people feel about their place, and that when people are more connected to their place, they're more likely to vote, 
They're more likely to volunteer to give charitably. They're even more likely to pay their taxes without complaining. True story. It's a wonderful study if you have an opportunity to look at it. So what we're talking about here is not necessarily this sort of exclusive, we're too cool for school attitude toward national change as much as we're talking about the economics of connection to place and the important role of knowing somebody you're doing business with. And what I'm seeing right now playing out across the country is this revival. How many of you knew that if you added up all the local independent coffee shops opening up across the country right now, it's outpacing the number of new Starbucks locations? Mm -hmm. That more bookstores have opened up in the last 10 years than it opened up the 20 years before that. Mm -hmm. Same with record stores, my background, right? And so more and more people are saying, actually relationships matter most because I've done it this other way and I don't like it so much, so I actually want to build these relationships. So for me, um, I think it's important to understand that these relationships have an economic impact. And we now know that for every two jobs a big chain store creates, three local jobs are lost in the community. So this study just came out, which is a powerful study. $10 million spent in the United States, spent at independent retailers, you can create and sustain 110 jobs. For the same $10 million spent in chain retailers, you create and sustain 50 jobs. Now we've known that part for almost 20 years now. For almost 20 years, we have known that we are limiting the number of job opportunities in our community when we bring chains in. And, I, and I'll explain that to you in a second. But this new study is the biggest threat to the US economy that we've known, in my opinion. That is a striking number. And by the way, they're still getting their robotics down, so that number is going to go down, not up. Right. So it's, it's important that we understand there is a consequence to that level of convenience. And it's a big consequence. So we need to really um, understand how this works. Just last holiday season, Americans spent over $680 billion just last holiday season. So imagine if we had spent that like we were trying to create jobs, right? And so a lot of you may be thinking, but the job market looks pretty good right now. But we know that there's a lot of people out there that are underemployed, right? They've got that degree, but they're a server. There's a lot of that going on, and there's a lot of people who have given up, and they're trying to become self-employed. So ultimately, we're talking about economic gardening. And with economic gardening, we're, we're working really hard to shift the priority from, uh, from this big business attraction and the only way to create jobs are the big companies to really thinking about how do we grow more talent um, from within. So we created a program that was called uh, Shift the Way You Shop, just to give you a sense of how much your dollars matter. In this campaign, I decided, you know, we're never going to be successful for demonizing people who choose to support local or shop on Amazon. That's not my goal, to make somebody feel bad about their choices. My goal is to make them want to try local and to make sure that local is good enough to make them want to come back. So our psychological thing was, all right, I'm going to ask people to simply shift 10% of their spending. And I can get a room riled up, you know, and I'd say, all right, who here can shift just 10%? Get in a local oil change, right? And this shift, we did a, a study that showed in a community the size of Tucson, which is significantly bigger than Asheville, but nonetheless, in a community the size of Tucson, 600,000 people, if everybody shifted just 10% of their spending, it would create 130 million new dollars circulating in that community and 1,600 brand new jobs, just for shifting 10% back to doing business locally. And so my job has been to go out and explain to people how this stuff works. And actually, in an effort to save time, I cut um, a slide out of here that I now wish that I hadn't. So you're going to have to just bear with me because I'm going to pretend that slide is on the screen because I think it's important for you to understand this. So imagine if this side of the screen had 15 Starbucks logos on it. That side of the screen has 15 independent coffee shops. So I'm going to tell you right now that I believe that Starbucks is the best chain that exists in the United States today. Does anybody want to guess why I think that? There's two reasons. Greg Frappuccino. Yeah, no. Their social responsibility, social. No, that's a good one, but that's not it. Free 
they make make everyone feel like they're in a local coffee shop. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Nope, those are all good reasons, but those aren't my reasons. My my reasons are twofold. Number one, they pay for the health care of their employees. What does that mean to you and me, okay? Um, About 25 years ago, national chain stores all of a sudden woke up and realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I don't offer health care to my employees, which is currently my number one expense, Above labor, above rent, I mean, I, I mean, other than labor, just below labor, but above rent is health care expenses. It's expensive. If we stop doing that, you mean all of those employees will just end up on the state health care program and you all are kind enough to pick up the tab? It's exactly what they did. Do you understand how that works? I'll find somebody in the room who loves music. Who loves music? Okay, right over here. I'll make you a deal. Forevermore, I'm going to give you a discount in my record store, 50% off. All you have to do is pick up all the health care for my employees. <laughs> do we have a deal? <laughs> no, that's a raw deal. It costs you a fortune. But that's the deal we do. You know, we go into the store and we think those are cheaper prices. But if they're not paying the health care of their employees and their employees end up on the state health care plan and we're footing that bill, that's deferred billing in the business world. We call that deferred billing. It's costing us a fortune. Starbucks doesn't do that. They pay for the health care of their employees. Thank you. Appreciate that. Number two, second reason they're the best, is they're not in the game of incentives. Starbucks doesn't call up Asheville and say, give us a million dollars and maybe we'll open a store. Or this is common practice. How many of you are familiar with Cabela's? Who's familiar with Cabela's store, right? Cabela's, master- Walmart is the one who introduced the incentive, but Cabela's mastered it, the subsidy. So... Let's see, on average, on average, Cabela's uh, brings in $35 million nationally per store. Per store, they call in advance. In my state, they claimed they were going to be the second largest tourist attraction after the Grand Canyon. (laughs) Right? The Arizona Republic put it on the front page. Cabela's coming to town, they're gonna be the second largest tourist attraction. Again, they average 35 million per store. In Glendale, Arizona, where our one Cabela's is, they got a $68 million subsidy. They got free land, they got free infrastructure, the city put in all their sidewalks and all the development stuff uh, that they needed, a street light to get in there. Uh, They got a 10 year sales tax abatement. Anybody know what that is? That means you go and you buy a tent and you pay your sales tax. And that money is supposed to go to your parks and your libraries and your fire departments. They get to keep it for 10 years, right? Right, so shocking. So now let's go back to this slide. Considering Starbucks pays their health care and Starbucks isn't in the business incentives, I'm still gonna show you how the economy works. Now, you walk in and you think it doesn't matter, you're spending your five bucks on a latte. Starbucks has the cost of doing business here in Asheville. How many graphic designers do they hire here in North Carolina? How about website developers? Do they hire a website developer out here? Payroll service providers? How about accountants? How about attorneys? Okay, the answer is zero. And those are called secondary jobs, and it turns out they make the world go round. On the other side of the screen, you got 15 independent coffee shops hired 15 graphic designers to do those logos. You had 15 accountants, you got 15 website developers to build those websites. That represents dollars and opportunities moving through your economy here locally. And now we can talk about the third time the dollar moves through the economy when the janitorial supply company gets the gig and they're only here cleaning the accounting firm offices and the only reason the accounting firm is here is because the local businesses hire them. So even as good as Starbucks is, they're still extracting the wealth from your community. Sure, they're bringing you barista jobs. Those ain't the jobs I'm worried about. It's the business professional jobs that get eliminated when the local businesses are removed from the economy. And so this is how it's important for all of us to understand. We could blow Starbucks up across the country and have 30,000 Starbucks locations, and they're still only going to employ one graphic design firm in the state of Washington and one website development firm in the state of Washington and one accounting firm in the state of Washington. The model is broken, and it does not build communities. This is not how we build a solid and self-reliant economy. 
So I also want to talk about race. Um, it's important that we understand wealth disparity in America. Right now, I would say if somebody made me pick one issue, it's wealth disparity. This inequity is powerful, and we need to all be paying attention to it because we cannot view our own situation as an isolated bottom line from others. So the newest study just came out. So median household income for an Anglo family in the United States is 122,000 right now. For an African American family, it's 1,200. Okay. In my particular community, we're 40% Latino, 1,600, just barely above that. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing to build an inclusive economy. Again, this was not on my mind when I started Local First Arizona. And I have had my eyes opened to how many um, missed opportunities we've had to really grow wealth and self-reliance in communities of color and how we all need to be having that conversation because I will tell you that the average African-American household in the United States net worth is going to reach zero by 2030 is the prediction. And how does that play out on all of the rest of the economy? It's, it's simply not sustainable, and we need to figure that out. So we started a program at Local First Arizona. This is Fuerza Local, that is Spanish for local force. It is a six-month business accelerator program that is completely taught in Spanish. Uh, this is a program that has two main goals. The first one is to teach advanced business curriculum to these folks so they can run more successful enterprises. We are not focused on startups. We're focused on people who are already in business but not being very successful at it. And the second goal is to help them understand and navigate credit so that they can access capital at fair market rates. In my community, we sometimes have two or three predatory lenders on one corner. They are everywhere. And it's, it's destroying our state's economy. And so predatory lenders, title loan places, check cashing places, I think those of us who are fortunate enough to be raised in a household that learned about uh, financial literacy when we were younger, we have a tendency to think, well, those folks just messed up their credit. When in reality, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a process that they've been excluded from. They don't understand that there's a better way. They've been shown by their parents and their grandparents that when you have an emergency, you go down and you take out a loan from the corner predatory lender because that's what, that's what we do. So I'm gonna share with you what we've done with this program is we've created what's called uh, e-money pool. It's a tanda, and that's probably not a familiar word to most of you in the room, but it's a, it's a savings program that's been used with low-income people around the world, Asia, Africa, South America. It's called a kundina, it's called uh, many, many names. But the general concept is you put 12 people in a room and they all pay into a kitty. And they pay into a kitty and then one person in the group gets to pull the money out one month at a time. So in, if my car broke down and I needed $1,200 or I'm going to lose my job, um, I would call my friends and family and we would form this money pool. Everybody would put $100 in and I would take first position get $1,200. And then everybody would continue to put $100 in each month. My aunt would say, I'll take second position. My uncle would say, I want January because I'm getting married and I could use the boost. This is the way they've learned how to save money together. We digitize that and put them together in a class of 12 total strangers. Our goal is to build relationships among themselves and to learn to trust each other. So they can see everybody in the class is green, yellow, or red in terms of their payment. So if somebody starts to fall behind, it's like, hey, Oh, what's going on or do you need help? Do, do we, we've seen people chip in to help each other stay on track. Why are we doing this? We're taking those payments and reporting them to Experion. So that every person that graduates from our program has a credit history and we have an introduction to a credit union or a community bank so that they can actually go forward accessing credit with a relationship. So now I'm going to tell you what is a story. This woman, Cake Art Studio, she came to our program speaking limited amount of English, a fantastic baker. She was excellent at what she did. She had no website. She had been sold three kinds of insurance that she didn't need. She had taken money out to buy equipment. She was operating in her kitchen. Uh, she was paying 48% interest on that money that she had borrowed. OK? 
okay? And that's common. That's actually the average. I've seen much worse than that, okay? Um, she didn't have contracts, so she would bake a cake for a family for a wedding. I mean, fantastic baker. She'd tell them over the phone it was $500, and she'd go to deliver it that day, and they'd say, well, sorry, we only have two seventy-five. dollars So she would take two seventy-five dollars and go home and feel sad. And her husband kept telling her, this is never going to work, right? And at that rate, it probably wasn't. She heard about our class and signed up, and she never missed a class. She was our star student in the front seat every day. She took advantage of every single mentorship opportunity. We helped work on her credit score. Uh, we helped her with everything related I mean, with her contracts. I mean, I used to argue with her. I'd tell her, here's your contract. You know, work with this. You've got to get 50% down. And she'd say, oh, I can't ask for money up front. And I said, don't you bake a thing, Rosie, until you have 50% down in your hand. She now has factored in her delivery fees. We got her the right kind of insurance. She is now in a credit union where she has lowered all that interest rate. We actually helped her move into a commercial kitchen. And three and a half years later, this woman has six full-time employees and a contract with our largest regional grocery store, right? <laughs> this is what an inclusive economy looks like. And every single one of them goes through a big graduation ceremony. And it's funny because all the people who fund our program, they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 this sounds really good. But I, if I can get them to the graduation, they, are, they just stand there with their mouth open because it is such a, a cultural difference that they can't understand how important this is. Everyone in the room, we had 550 people come out to cheer on our last class, including a bunch of past graduates. Everyone dressed to the nine, and when they walk across that stage, it is aunts and uncles and kids and everybody snapping pictures. Many of these folks never graduated from anything. And they have a signed certificate from Congressman Ruben Gallego congratulating them. And it is a transformative moment in their life where they know going forward they can always come back and count on us to grow, help them grow their company. And they're, they're creating a huge number of jobs. We have over 500 graduates that have gone on to create over 800 jobs in four years. So we can't just focus, again, on attracting big companies to move in. We need to be paying attention to everyone in our community and making sure they all have opportunities to succeed in order to build a vibrant and successful economy for everyone. So I'm going to shift gears on you a little bit here, and we're going to talk about the built environment. So there are several key components for developing entrepreneurship at every level. Um, adequate building stock. You certainly have adequate building stock now, but part of being adequate is affordable. And so one of the biggest challenges that's going to be coming the way of Asheville is increasing rent prices that cause displacement of the local businesses, that create the relationship, that create the secondary and tertiary jobs we talked about, like accountants and graphic designers, et cetera, et cetera and the ones that really create the interest and unique flavor that drives your tourism as well, right? All of that stuff is connected. So we can't just think, well, we might lose a few businesses. As you lose businesses and the bigger ones come in, um, the bigger ones you can find in other towns. They're not unique to this place. And so it hurts in a lot of different ways. Access to capital is critically important, and I'm going to talk a lot about that because I just can't underscore enough what's happened in banking over the last 10 years has choked off access to capital in many of our communities. And uh, we need to be, have a heightened awareness about it, about where our money is. And then collaboration and marketplace are critically important, but I don't have time to dive into them. And again, Asheville Grown uh, Business Alliance is doing a lot of that work already. So adaptive reuse, I worked extensively on the adaptive reuse of existing buildings uh, in Arizona because our older building stock was not currently up to code and we had an entire city staff that was rigidly interpreting building code and so they needed a path forward um, and so one of the things that I worked on was getting the, uh, they adapted the uh, international existing building code which is much more flexible and has the uh, opportunity to usher businesses through and say, instead of no, we can't help you, to yes, we can help you. How do we help you get through this process? And those are the vital older buildings that are the incubate, incubator spaces for our small local businesses. They're affordable. They're funky. We're, we'll take the risk of moving into a junked out, you know, gross, disgusting building. 
In fact, I won't buy anything that's not gross and disgusting. You know, if I, if, you know, I mean, I mean, it's just that's that's my rule of thumb because I like to buy things that are affordable and uh, turn them into something where people just can't believe uh, what they're looking at. They didn't see it. And then remembering that the greenest building of all is an existing building. I think it was the Nature Conservancy. They tore down a perfectly good 1950s br uh, brick building to put a LEED certified building up. And I was like, <laughs> not sure I understand that. You know, So we've got to be sure we keep it. So this study I'm going to talk a little bit about called Older, Smaller, Smaller Better. <laughs> I just want to talk to you about it now, today, before you start allowing it to become common practice to tear down older buildings and or to move large developments in, do a land assemblages, things that start threatening the actual character of your community. So this study, I highly recommend it to everyone in the room, Older, Smaller, Better, which really demonstrates that communities that went out of their way to protect their older building stock, which you... You've done better than 90% already. You made it, you know, it's like that depression that caused you to not have the money to tear it all down and, and do it wrong before, but you're gonna get a second chance at it. You're gonna get a second chance at it because it'll come for you again. It will. So what we know is that um, building size and age matters, that every community should have a diverse array of socioeconomic status, you, you need to make sure that all people have a part an ability to participate in building a, a, a healthy life for themselves and their families. A diverse array of activities and being clear on your history. I mean, I'll tell you, I had a fantastic cab driver here in Asheville from the airport. I mean, this woman, it was like, I wish I had it recorded because I asked her uh, if she could recommend a restaurant and she probably named off without exaggeration 30, including what I should eat when I go there. As, you know, as if I had a pen and paper was writing, I was like, I just need one because I'm hungry right now. You know, but she was fantastic. I was like, God, she should be on the payroll for a tour. I mean, she was great. Um, but protecting those walkable streets um, and understanding the importance of that connectivity to the street. And we're dealing with this in Arizona right now. We've got these suburban developers that have come in and they're trying to do urban design and they're practicing on my city and it's terrible. And so things like we actually have apartments that have moved in, you cannot exit. You're gonna, just, just hear me out. You cannot exit as a resident onto the street. You have to exit to the parking garage. That is vertical suburban mind thought, you know, mind process. So these are the kinds of things. I mean, we worked so hard to require, we mandated ground floor retail, never imagining that developers would find a loophole that a gym for the residents could be considered ground floor retail. So now what used to be that great walkable arts district I talked about is now a bunch of apartments and we're looking at empty elliptical machines all day long. And Phoenix is a lot the whipping boy because we made a lot of mistakes, but we were right there guarding the process and it still happened to us. So if you have development that's not rooted in community and does not share your vision for walkable local economy, you may not get what you want, even if you've tried to structure it in such a way. So the reason I bring this up is because we have to understand the connectivity between the development and the health and well-being of the overall community, whether it's walkable uh, health or economic health, character, sense of place, hometown pride, all of those things are connected to how your community is built. And we may not think about it every day, but it's critically important. So in this particular study, they demonstrated that building stock, the, the, the communities that had the oldest, most diverse, fine-grained buildings actually performed better on jobs, <coughs> significantly better. So if you allow them to come in and blade five older buildings and put up one new one and convince you that that's going to be better for the community, you'll actually end up with fewer jobs, especially when you start counting secondary and tertiary jobs. And finally, we find you know, not only greater walkability, but younger residents. I mean, you are living proof that young people like old buildings. They're moving here in droves. 
right? And uh, this is critically important that they actually, in this study, what they did, I think this is so brilliant, they, um, they overlaid cell phone usage at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night with where the city's older building stock was. And they did this in multiple cities. And they found a direct correlation to the areas where the older buildings existed and activity on a Saturday night. And that's so important for youth retention. Do you know how many rural communities across the country are losing their young people? And they're trying to figure out how to keep them there. You're an exception to the rural, and, and some folks would not even consider you uh, rural. From my perspective, I live in a city of four and a half million people. Uh, you would still qualify as rural. Here in North Carolina, not so much. Um, the rural communities would consider you to be urban. But it's, it's just very important that we consider these things. So more jobs, more creative jobs, and more businesses per square foot uh, are in, in communities where they've protected their older building stock. Also, more women and minority-owned businesses, non-chain businesses, they keep more dollars and jobs circulating in the community. So now I'm going to shift to how do we finance it? How do we finance it? So looking at era, Phoenix versus Denver, when I started this work, our total deposits, and I mean total deposits, that means individual savings and checking accounts, business checking accounts, government deposits, 96% of our total deposits were in non-local banks. <coughs> Essentially, we said, go ahead and take our money and invest it elsewhere. We're not worthy. That's what we said. And what I did is I came in and I did a study in, around the last downturn, 2009 and 10. Um, the three biggest banks, Chase, in my community, are Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. Those three banks had 76% of our money, and over a two-year span, they could only demonstrate that they had loaned $18 million in Arizona. All three banks, a total of $18 million. That's like, we were the last state to, to reach pre-recession levels. The very last state, and that's why right there. Because lines of credit were cut, small businesses, medium businesses, large businesses. The average loan that they completed was $2 million. I, I don't know any businesses that need $2 million. And in fact, if you can qualify for a $2 million loan, you don't need $2 million. You just happen to want it, right? So we worked really hard on a move your money campaign, and we have shifted almost 6% market share out of those three ba big banks. So Wells Fargo is on our team because they've been doing so bad. Uh, I mean, what I mean is they're helping us, you know, get people to move their money. Um, but um, it's critically important to understand that that amount of money moved into our community banks has been a game changer. We have partnerships now with community banks and credit unions that will do little loans. We at Local First Arizona, we started a micro lending program ourselves in which we're focused on, on loans as small as $5,000. And with our micro lending program, so far we've lent out $120,000 and we've already created 19 jobs with it. That's a little bit better deal than those multi-million dollar deals to bring jobs in, right? And, and of course, they're not as good at uh, paying jobs. They're not. But they're building self-reliance and opportunities for families to make sure that they can keep food on the table. So we have 80% of our counties now have no local banking option whatsoever. Think about that. Right? Think about how hard it is to grow a company in a small town when you can't access capital. And so... We only have 13 community banks left. In, in the state of Texas, by comparison, they've got over 500. So compare that to downtown Denver. Um, other top three banks, one is a community bank, First Bank. They are uh, a huge, the fourth wealthiest private bank in the US. And I went through downtown Denver and all of the revitalization that they had done down there. And I said, who, who, paid, who funded this? First Bank. Who funded this? First Bank. Who funded this? First Bank. I talked to 18 different redevelopment projects, and First Bank had done every single one of them. Not one person said Bank of America. Not one person said Wells Fargo. 
So it's important, again, back to this concept of relationships, it's important to have that relationship with a banker that actually shares the vision of the community. And community banks have to lend locally, that's how they make their money. So they're much more motivated to find a way to make it work rather than just having you know, your, your underwriter on the other side of the country say, yeah, no, I don't know what that is, I'm not gonna fund that, right? So now I'm gonna talk a little bit in my final time here on uh, tourism and the work that we did in this little town called Bisbee. Anybody familiar with Bisbee, Arizona? A couple people, okay. Oh, good. So um, this is a, a great little town that consistently wins best, you know, best small town in America, best town in the Midwest. It's an old mining town, beautifully preserved old building stock. That's their main street right there. Um, it is a blast, it, it's truly a blast. Well, they hired me to come in and do an, a, a, a tourism study to understand what's going wrong. They won all these awards, and yet their tourism numbers were flat. They had all these new people coming in, but what they discovered was people weren't coming back. And so we did a study um, over about a six-month period, doing a lot of interviews with people in the community and doing a lot of work um, to try to identify the root causes of some of the challenges they were having. And when I walked in to make this presentation to mayor and council, these are the four key takeaways. And pretty much they, 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 were, they were outraged. We asked you to talk to us about tourism. And they said, I'm going to if you'll give me a second, right? They were like, we don't want to hear about economic leakage. Why, why aren't the tourists coming, right? And so I took about 30 minutes to explain all of this stuff. So, their small businesses are suffering because the locals don't want to go downtown anymore. And the locals were like, we're out, right? We're, 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 we're sick and tired of all these tourists and we can't find a parking spot, we're fed up. Those businesses, I'm seeing a lot of grinning going on in this room. Um, those businesses couldn't survive just on the tourists alone. And in fact, the more this went on, the less relevant the businesses became to the locals because they had to get more in for the tourists and it became sh shifting even less and less toward locals, right? And you start losing critical things that locals need. And so we, we interviewed all these people to talk about where they were spending their money. And what was interesting is the young people in the town were making an effort to support the local businesses and the old people in town were bitterly shopping on Amazon and they loved it. It was like, I talked to an old woman and ordered a toilet on Amazon. I, and she was proud of it because she was so angry that she couldn't find a parking space downtown. Talk about misdirected rage, right? Um, <laughs> you know, and I mean, she was just clicking with fire. I mean, I'm sure that clicker button was probably worn off on her computer by that point. So we, we worked with them to help them understand, okay, so you're also angry that your library is only open for two hours a day now, right? Okay, so let's talk about your spending habit and the outcome, what you, what you have going on in this community, because they weren't connecting. I mean, I, I met a woman one time who was proudly bragging about doing all of her holiday shopping online and all the sales tax that she had saved, and then I found out her husband was a firefighter. <laughs> I was like, hmm. So you're actively trying not to feed into the coffers that pay your husband's salary. Well, she just paled, right? It's not because she was wickedly trying to do that. She just never thought of it before. We forgot how the economy works, right? So talking to them about economic leakage and how important it is to get the locals understanding that we can't survive. Like, okay, Asheville's gonna change much more rapidly if the locals don't continue to support the businesses here. We need to understand that. Workforce gaps. What had happened was Airbnb had moved into Bisbee. Airbnb had taken over a lot of the affordable housing stock for rentals. Who lived in that affordable housing stock but the artists? What do the artists do to pay their bills? They were the servers and the retailers and the stores. So you displace them with Airbnb and they move out and suddenly you got a whole parcel of restaurants and retailers who can either hire people with drug problems who are left in the community or high school students. And you look at their, at their reviews on Yelp as a community and they went like that. 
because not the primary impact of Airbnb, but the secondary and tertiary impacts of Airbnb. You displaced your workforce, and you don't have a, you don't you didn't even recognize that it happened. All your artists left. Okay, a lack of collaboration and inconsistency. Those are a little bit more obvious, but how many times do we work in a, in a community where everybody's got to start out and do their own thing? I mean, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll just tell you, I'm kind of going over here, but I just want to share this with you. You know, on Roosevelt, the street that I talked about where I moved in and I opened up an art gallery, I used to have my art openings on Friday, first Friday, right? The second guy moved in about a year and a half later. So I was there by myself for a year and a half having my little first Friday receptions, right? You know, it's like, I'd be excited if 150 people would come, okay? Second guy moves in. He's kind of, he walks into my gallery and he's kind of looking kind of sheepish. And I said, what, you know, what, what's going on? He goes, well, would you be mad if I opened up an art gallery in the building next door? Now imagine that. <laughs> yeah, dude, this is my bombed out stretch of downtown Phoenix, right? <laughs> would I be mad? No, I go, that would be awesome. I jumped up and I hugged him. Two art galleries is better than one. Six months later, the third guy opened up across the street and he had panini and wine. I'm like, two art galleries and some panini? <laughs> now we're talking, right? The next is history. It just went, and all of these people moved in and took over all of these older buildings. And Now just imagine like a needle on the record, let's go back. And what if guy number two had said, mm, I don't know about this first Friday thing. I'm gonna go with second Saturdays. <laughs> Imagine if guy number three had said, you guys are both wrong, I'm gonna do Wednesday night specials, right? <laughs> no, we all hit that nail over and over and over on first Friday and today, even today, even though there's really hardly any art left, there's empty elliptical machines, as I mentioned. The city doesn't know how to stop it, and it's 30,000 people every first Friday descend on downtown. It's mostly just to watch each other at this point. <laughs> but the reality is, is by hitting that nail over and over and over, all of us in a unified chorus, we created the largest art walk in the country. And it could have easily gone wrong if we didn't understand how to collaborate, right? We had to, we had to work together, I mean, we, Work together, we're open, hell or high water on Saturday. How many people do you think are walking around downtown Phoenix in August to look for art? <laughs> but we're open. Because you never know when a busload of people from Germany is going to walk in and they don't know that it's 124 and they think it's kind of cool. <laughs> I survived, you know. We're open. And we made a pledge to each other and, and we're open. And that's what we do. So, and the inconsistency is just, it's nutty. I mean, in this particular town, they had two visitor centers because they couldn't get, get along on what should go in the visitor center. How confusing is that, you know? Or, or this is a good one, this is a good one. Um, their town plan, major goal is to do better at attracting families, right? That was their number one goal is we've got to attract families. And yet, in all of my um, surveying, they only had, um, of a total of 32 lodging options there, only five of them would even allow children under 10. But, that was, but they had somehow gone through the entire process and said, we're really gonna work on this. And I was like, no, you're not. Right, so inconsistency can really sink a community. I think oftentimes we forget how important it is to include the local businesses in the conversation. I don't know whether or not you're doing that here, but I see it all the time. We'll develop an entire tourism plan and forget to tell the local businesses. We've really got to include them in the conversation, make sure they're on board and they're going to fall in line and, 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 and carry that torch, whatever it might be. So that's critically important. And I think, yeah, that's just um, a slide that shows you all the very many programs that we run today. Just to give you a quick rundown, the top left, that is our business coalition, Local First Arizona. We have 3,500 businesses. Good Food Finder is a website we run that helps connect people to healthy local food. And uh, we're working behind the scenes on strengthening Arizona's food producers and food systems that get healthy food uh, into schools and elsewhere. Uh, the foundation, which is focused on um, three key areas, the business accelerator that I just mentioned called Fuerza Local, as well as rural community and economic development and food systems development. Fuerza Local, I explained what that is to you. Um, Devour Local is our restaurant coalition. We're working on helping uh, them buy uh, compostables and other such things right now. We're kind of focused on not only food sourcing, but helping them become more sustainable. 
Forum is the program that we run that is includes, inclusive of the development community and trying to get them to understand how important it is to uh, look at adaptive reuse, uh, to build in a walkable urban environment, and to create small suites. Like one of the things I'm advocating for right now, um, there's an RFP that's going to go out on a city-owned property that is, is in a very multicultural area that has a lot of refugee and immigrant families there. They're very entrepreneurial. Um, I'm advocating that the RFP actually have written into it that the developer must put in a commercial kitchen and three to 500 square foot suites in front of it so five or six families could actually incubate and you could have foods of the world uh, right there uh, in front of one shared commercial kitchen which would make it much more affordable. We've already got two developers who said, yeah, I'd do that. So um, working with the, the city on, on making sure we, we get in front of what we want rather than being reaction and just saying that's not what we wanted. We want to show what we want before they even come in and build it. The localist program is for our individuals. They can pay $10 a month to have inside access tickets and things that we do uh, ahead of time. Uh, cool tours of funky old mansions that people always wonder what it looks like on the inside. What we're doing it really is building hometown pride through that program. Weekend Zona is where we try to get people to go out and explore Arizona rather than just going to Disneyland or, or the ocean out in San Diego. And then we are the state's Arizona Rural Development Council, uh, which is literally a federally designated uh, rural development council. Um, every state used to have one, and there's only 15 of them left. And um, that's been a wonderful experience for me. When I first got there, they have an annual conference. They, they stopped, the whole room stopped, and they said, Arizona? Nobody's been here from Arizona in 25 years. So, you know, it's been great picking that up and learning how to run with it. We just got some funding um, uh, appropriated uh, in the uh, Farm Bill for the Rural Development Councils, and now we just have to figure out how to get it actually al allocated. <laughs> so, so that is us in a nutshell. I hope that you have found this to be at least entertaining, if not informative, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions for me. Yes. You ever been in the other oh, that was the question. <laughs> um, thank you so much for all your hard work. Oh and yeah. It's very inspiring. So it, if I were a um, an elected official and I was in charge of economic development, the model of giving people tax breaks and trying to buy, get the big kahuna there seems a lot easier than what you're doing. Mm -hmm. How do you incentivize um, the elected officials to go this route? Um, so, I, I think that the trick is to explain the difference. What we do is uh, we work with electeds to make sure they can get out in front of one of our success stories. So really what they're looking for, especially, so there's two ways to look at it. There's, there's staff, right, in which um, it's about sharing and developing new strategies. With electeds, they want to be there on the ribbon, the ribbon cutting. So, we make a habit of inviting them, if it's in their district, uh, to come out and celebrate and actually uh, give them credit and opportunity to talk about um, the, the, the win in, in my language. So I, I've actually been known to develop talking points for elected officials, invite them, and then here's what you're going to say. And then they look like geniuses, and then it all works out in the end. So I, I would literally be able to say, you know, this is, um, a, a, let's say, five of our Fuerza graduates, they opened up a share, they shared a, a space where they have one secretary and then they're, they're all in a shared space. So we invited the council person to come to that and I provided the council person with the information about how many uh, jobs they had created, what they were going to be doing, um, all of those kinds of things, and show them, like, this didn't cost the city anything, but you're going to be here and celebrate with me because this is transformative for this part of town. And um, so it's more of an incentive for them to, and showing them, like there's, there's a much more cost effective way to do this. I don't think that's going to cause them to stop showing up at the big, huge uh, event that is a business attraction that costs millions and millions of dollars. But what we're trying to do is show them that there's a value to both and to get them to think about shifting some of their attention and energy. I also think it's important to talk to elected officials about challenges related to build affordable building stock and access to capital because those are things that they, that aren't on their radar what do you mean our businesses are getting priced out or what do you mean uh, they don't have access to capital or even working on workforce development you know you, you they may be 
that's another way that we've been helpful having a hard time attracting companies to come in because they can't find the right workforce. So how do we come in and work with the high schools and the community colleges to actually develop curriculum, especially in our small towns? So um, those are the kinds of things we're doing to provide, I call it providing cover for an elected official so that they can really shine uh, with a new model. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to help the city of Phoenix shift money away from Amazon and, and actually you've helped them connect with those local businesses and actually, mm -hmm. you know, you're showing them and you're, and you're telling them why it's beneficial, but you're also providing them with the tools to do so. Yeah, we, um, we, we did a couple of economic studies um, and I wrote two Senate bills to try to change the way the state of Arizona procures goods. So um, there's a, f a funny story that I actually told on the Senate floor. How many of you recognize the name Buzz Aldrin? Right? So you may remember when Buzz Aldrin was getting ready to blast off for the first time, the news media asked him what's on his mind. Anybody remember what he said? He said that this thing was built on low bid wins. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, just the whole idea that we operate that way, um, we've got to save money. And so we end up awarding contracts to companies that bring us jobs with no health care benefits that ends up costing us a fortune. So what we did is we, first of all, we demonstrated to the city of Phoenix that several of their key contracts were actually costing money. That a $5 million office supply contract with Staples. Staples brought Arizona 65% part-time employees with no health care benefits. And we demonstrated they were losing a half million dollars a year on that one contract. And that got their attention. Okay, so then we started doing outreach. Um, we, as uh, the local coalition, decided that we would be the leaders, and we brought the um, ASBA, Arizona Small Business Association, the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, the Hispanic Chamber, the Gay and Lesbian Chamber, the Black Chamber. We brought uh, Minority Business Supplier Source, all of these organizations together to collaborate on one uh, event, well, it, it, it happens twice a year, but one event together to save city staff time, um, they can come out now and talk to a whole bunch of people about how to become vendors with the city. So I applied pressure from both sides. One is demonstrating that the way they were doing it was costing them money, and then helping them populate with quality uh, bidders, um, and that, that helped close the gap, and so, um, they just, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance just did a study looking at um, Amazon's new frontier is government spending. And uh, Phoenix, Arizona is, uh, got the number one spot for spending the least. We spent 800 bucks last year with Amazon um, and we actually rent them a warehouse so we profited 15 grand. We are the only city in the nation that profited off of Amazon last year. Um, so yeah, so it's really, I think Meg, it's about a, applying pressure from both sides. You got to show that it doesn't work and provide cover for the elected officials to push for change, but you also have to help them make it easier. I mean, when I called up city staff and said I would donate my time to coordinate everybody, because they were trying to go and talk to all these different networks of businesses, and I was like, no, 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 no. Let me make that easy for you. And they were like, really? You'll do that? And that's what, they were like, great. So I just had the head of procurement call me right before my trip here and said, hey, when's the next one? Right. So um, they, they get to make, make it simpler for them. Who else? Yes. I'll ask a question. You, your programs addressing <coughs> racial wealth disparities are really interesting and, and exciting to hear about. And at the same time, you're talking about adaptive reuse, which drives buzz in a neighborhood, which also sometimes causes displacement. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you simultaneously address that, that displacement as ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ownership. it's ownership. It really, that's the deal. I'm, Adaptive reuse is great uh, for rentals, but if, if you don't have local ownership when you're doing that, um, it, 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 it will all be for naught because it will be undone and displaced and that's where the cycle happens. So it really does come down to finding ways to create a capital stack that enables and empowers lower income people to figure out how to buy their home. And so we're looking at community land trust, we're looking at a wide variety of mechanisms to be able to allow for ownership. Um, one developer in Phoenix, I'll give him a shout out, he happens to be my husband, he does a lot of adaptive reuse and he just took over a 20,000 square foot restaurant and put five local businesses in it. It was an old abandoned, it was a restaurant years ago, but it was abandoned, uh, empty for almost 10 years, roof caving in, that kind of a thing. 
Um, and he gave 10% ownership to every single one of his tenants. So they now have a vote in what the rents are going to be. And he did that in an effort to make sure that even when he pulls out of the deal that they will still have ownership there. So there's ways to get it done. Now, when he went to a bank and said, hey, will you fund this project? They were like, are you kidding me? They don't even understand. They're not going to take the time to understand it. So he had to go out and get really creative with the capital to make it work. But it's working very well, and they, they each have a vote on, um, on what they're going to do with the development. So there's, but it really comes down. On Roosevelt Street, I'll mention it one more time, there, the three of us that were the first ones um, on the street, we all bought our old buildings. And now that everything has happened, we're the only three left. And so that tells the story right there. That tells the story right there. Yeah. 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 So I hear what you're saying about you know local businesses circulating more jobs back in the local economy, um, but it was hard for me to connect with the presentation overall because like wages weren't really mentioned very often. In fact, I think you only really explicitly mentioned them once or twice. Once to acknowledge that the 19 jobs that were created through the microcredit system were actually low-wage jobs, um, and additionally to say that Starbucks is offering healthcare to their workers, which a lot of local businesses don't. Um, so, you know, we actually have pretty good employment numbers right now. We're not worried about the number of jobs as much as we are about the quality of jobs. We know that we have a wage problem in the country and we have a bad wage problem here. So, um, how does sure. what you're talking about connect with wage growth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's not something that, um, that I addressed in this presentation, but we've actually done a lot of work uh, in Arizona working with businesses that are advocates of the living wage. Um, and we've actually taken a lot of heat because our restaurants are opposed. But some of the things that we've done, as an example, is uh, Seattle has the highest living wage in the country. So we brought several uh, restaurant tours from Seattle to Phoenix to help our restaurant tours understand how what alternatives there are, what ways could they be thinking about deferring tips and other such things to increase their wages. And we actually, uh, in northern Arizona, is the highest living wage in, in, uh, in Arizona. And um, so bringing them the tools and resources to better understand that. Um, and also, I think it's important to say that with the low wage jobs that we are creating, um, part of the curriculum in Poison Local is to help them understand that the more successful the business is, that the wages must increase as well. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we're addressing that um, that I didn't go into detail here today, but I'd be more than happy to talk to you afterward, or uh, if you want to shoot me an email, I can send you some of the examples of the work. Um, the one thing I do want to point out, though, is right now you don't have a job uh, problem, but you will. Um, and so it's important to understand that these are cyclical things that happen in the country, and um, it, it will come around again. So the idea is to build as much self-reliance. Like if we all just said, well, we, we don't have a job problem right now, let's all shop on Amazon, because uh, doesn't, that doesn't really affect our community here, then during the next downturn is when you're really going to feel it. Um, so what I'm trying to do is have a conversation about how to deeply understand um, how we create jobs with our spending and that the economy is ours to own so that we can be more self-reliant and resilient the next time the bottom falls out. So, but I'd be more than happy to do it. It's an important point that you make, absolutely. Yes. The rural situation in our country, and we've had other presenters in our community that have talked about the fact that we're losing population, and I think more than half of the counties in North Carolina, and this isn't just in North Carolina, it's all over the country. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're becoming these liberal urban centers and everything else is kind of drying up and going away. And I'd love to have you just address that for a few minutes and you know, what some of those solutions you feel might be. Yeah. Um, so it, just to make sure that I'm clear, the solutions mm -hmm. for uh, retaining people in the smaller towns. Well, and, and creating some economic uh, viability for these communities. Sure. Really. Right. So um, there's a few different things. One is... <laughs> I'll use a couple of the little towns that we've worked in right now in the breakdown. So we've got a town of 1,300. They have one grocery store. And the majority of the people will save up their money and drive two hours to Phoenix to buy at Costco. So part of our work is helping them build a relationship with the grocery store owner. So we started by showing the grocery store owner our studies on economic leakage. And they were shocked to find out how much money is going to Costco two hours away. 
And that kind of got their attention to try to work on it a little bit more. And then we go back to the community and help them understand if they lose that grocery store, what they're going to be losing. And then we facilitate conversations to try to get the grocery store to be more responsive to the needs of the community. Um, and also to be like, for example, there's a lot of food producers in that particular town. They have the Center for Sustainable Agriculture there. And to be more responsive, not only to not ordering in peaches if the Center for Sustainable Agriculture just brought in a bunch of peaches, but also buying from them, buying surplus from them and collaborating together. So that's an example around food systems of how we're trying to retain that resiliency in those smaller towns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who else has any questions? All right. Thank you for staying a little late with me here tonight. I appreciate it.